people are having the best times of their life. A lot of times they're on vacation, like go somewhere. You go to the beach, you go to the mountains, you go to the whitewater rafting, you go somewhere where the environment is beautiful. And I think that when, when I think about what is the perfect world look like, well, I think one, thinking about the earth, the earth looks perfect. And so it's full of rainforests and there's no pollution. Everything is green and beautiful and lush. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. B, triple board certified MD and performance and longevity expert. And on today's podcast, I give you the natural tools to tap into human performance, health, and longevity. Over the past few years, there's new technologies that are super exciting, promising to push the human lifespan further than we ever thought possible. We have regenerative technologies such as stem cells and exosomes that could be really used to treat and regenerate tissues that are failing on us. We've got organ transplantation to be able to help when our organs fail. We've got gene editing to fix faulty genes. We've got ways of diagnosing disease at a much earlier level, either in the DNA level or the cellular level. All these new technologies and what I group together as the science of longevity. But if we actually look at where people live longest, they actually don't have access to any of this information. In fact, they live life in such a way that allows them to live longer. And on today's podcast, we really dive in deep into some of that, how we eat, how we move, how we think, how we feel, whether or not we are tapped into something greater. And this, is, I think, is going to be on the forefront in the longevity space and spirituality a connection with something greater than ourselves, knowing that we are connected to a higher power, connected to each other. And I think once we start to know and understand that and embody that within our own body, we are giving ourselves the signals to activate the genes of longevity rather than activating the genes of inflammation and decreased immunity when we are in our stress state. Now, before we get into our podcast, and you're not going to want to miss this, you know who this person is. I'm saving it for a minute now. But if you're new to the podcast, welcome in. This is a place, this is an energy for you to be able to tap into the tools, the ideas, the concepts to take your life into what I call the thrive state, which is the state of being or consciousness that actually activates our human potential, allows us to live longer, perform better, and for us to feel happier and more content with this beautiful gift of life that we are all blessed to have. Now, if you're returning to the podcast and if this is giving you value, please help this show grow by sharing it with your friends and family members, subscribing to the podcast, turning on those notifications so you don't miss an episode, engaging with us by leaving a comment and certainly giving us a five-star review wherever podcasts are heard. That is really going to do us the favor of bringing this message, growing this message, and for bringing possibility into the world and the universe. So thank you so much for being a new listener or a loyal listener and for your help to contribute to this movement of growth and possibility. And as a free kiss, I want to give you a big bundle of resources for human performance and longevity. Go to thrivestatestarter.com completely free and it's going to kickstart you into your path to human potential to bring you more health and happiness. Now on to our next guest. I have actually followed him for years now with his original YouTube channel and you've seen his growth. He's done other than Dr. Josh Axe, a leadership expert, entrepreneur, and physician. He's earned his doctorate from Palmer College and his master's of science in organizational leadership from Johns Hopkins University. He's actually the co-founder and CEO of Ancient Nutrition and founder of DrAxe.com. His company is ranked on the 8500 fastest growing companies two years in a row. He's the best-selling author of Eat Dirt, Keto Diet, and Ancient Remedies. Dr. Josh is the founder of Leaders.com, an online platform that provides the latest on breaking news, leadership, business, and wealth. He regularly teaches, lectures, and trains entrepreneurs on leadership, mindset, self-development. He's married to his beautiful wife, Chelsea, and they have two daughters. He's a girl dad, just like me. They've been living in Nashville, Tennessee, and Dorado, Puerto Rico, and enjoy cooking, staying 
active with swimming and cycling and prioritize your time with faith and family. His latest book, Think This and Not That, is now available for all of us to check out. So ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this conversation with myself and Dr. Josh Axe. Josh Axe, welcome to the Thrive State Podcast. Dr. V, thanks for having me. Great to see you. It was great to have you for the Thrive State Summit. We know so many people got value out of hearing about these ancient remedies. But today, I wanted to bring out some new topics. Topics on your take on longevity, your take on spirituality. But before we get into that, my friend, we do a version of a game show on this called The Five to Thrive. Five quick questions to get to know you better. 1,000 right. each. And if you win, the next time we meet in real life, you get a healthy meal on me. So my question to you is, Dr. Axe, are you ready to play the five that's right? I am. Question number one is, if you could have one health-related superpower, what would that be? Oh, well, I think the ability to heal. You'd be great. <laughs> what you okay, Wolverine. So that would be that would be up there. And you know what? Certainly with everything that you're talking about, we actually have that innate ability. We just happen to lose that ability if we're not conscious about how we're living our life, right? Yeah. 1,000 points there. Question number two is, is there a, being a health guru, and I certainly have my own versions of this, but what would be one unhealthy or guilty pleasure that you have in your life? It's tough. You know, I think, well, let me give you an example. So Chelsea and I, my wife, we were about to bring our two, two little girls to Europe this summer, and we will probably have pizza and gelato. And so, you know, I, I generally am pretty, pretty healthy things. We still eat chocolate cake, chicken parmesan, sourdough bread. We just make it all at home from natural ingredients. And so I would say that but if we're vacationing, going somewhere like Europe, we'll, we'll do some pizza and gelato. Well, great there. The thing is the pasta and the pizza, when you have it over there, for, for me, it doesn't kind of cause the same kind of inflammation and bloating yeah. versus eating them here. Yeah, I agree. Question number three is what one quote, book, or piece of advice that you got anywhere in your life that when you heard it or listened to it, you're like, oh my God, life is completely different. What was that for you? You become who you surround yourself with. That really shifted everything for me, and it's my biggest life lesson. I had somebody tell me that one in my early 20s, and I, I, I sort of refocused on who I was spending time with, really started focusing on people that wanted to grow, were very purpose-driven in life, had a high degree of character. And it, it just it just literally shifted my whole life. I, know I, I am very, very conscious about who I spend time with, the relationships I pursue, in terms of who I'm friends with, who I, I allow to mentor me. All those people, there, there, there's a there's a very short example of this, but there are uh, there's a story of two homeless men sitting on a bench. And one turned to one and he said, uh, how did you get here? And he said, I didn't listen to anybody. And the other one turned to the one who just asked him a question. He said, well, how did you end up here? He said, I listened to everybody. And so I think it's a similar thing is I'm very conscious about who are the top 1% of the 1% in their financial life, in their spiritual life, in their health. Those are the people I'm going to listen to and I'm, I'm going to grab a hold of what they're sharing in order to help me grow. But I think it's a very similar thing where I think about the people I want to spend time with and become like. It's a very small portion of people. And typically you have to pursue those people and those relationships, just like pursuing your spouse or, or anything you really want in life. And so I definitely pursue and I'm very conscious about my relationships. Well, knowing that, I'm very honored that you've taken time to spend a little time with me today. So not only that, 3,000 points thus far. Two more questions for the bag. After a long day at work, what would be one of your favorite things to do, your go-to thing to do to kind of compress? Cook. I, I love spending time in the kitchen. Even when I was, when I was single and now when I'm married and now that I have kids, when I get home from a long day, for some reason, for me, that just takes my mind off everything. Now, some people say that's the last thing they want to do. <laughs> for me, but for me, it's just a stress reliever. I have fun in the kitchen. I love making food. And so that's uh, that's pretty high on my list. Awesome. 4,000 points. Last question here is, will you marry me? For No, that's not the last question. The last question is, if I were going to put you on stage with 100,000 people, handed you a microphone, and then had you pick a karaoke song to sing, and you had to do it, what song would you pick? Wow. 
This is a hard one. Well, if my wife were in the audience, she'd probably want me to sing. He's a little younger than me, about six years. She was a big fan of In Sync and the Backstreet Boys, so I'd probably <laughs> have to pick, a, pick one of their songs. So Backstreet's are back or what? Back, back. I, I'm trying to think of actually one of their songs, but it's. Uh, you know, let, me, let me think though on another note. My dad, growing up, we listened to a lot of oldies, and so there was a guy named Sam Cooke who I love, and he oh. bring it on home. It's actually in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie as well. That's a great one. So that that, that might be it. I probably awesome. sing some. Well, we have great taste in music because I love the Guardians of the Ga Galaxy soundtrack. All those oldies are awesome. And guess what? Five thousand points. You win the five to thrive, which means healthy meal on me next time. All right. <laughs> And I can't wait to dive into this conversation. First of all, if you haven't listened to my conversation with Josh on the Thrive State Summit, I, I highly urge you, we go deep into natural remedies that I want people to listen to. But today's topic is really on something I wrote in Mind Body Green. I wrote a, an article there talking about the future of longevity as well as spirituality. So I wanted to take your take on it. Now, we know out there in the world, longevity is this new, exciting thing that I think from a marketing perspective, people are using. We've got many gadgets in the biohacking space. We've got a lot of new science, nutraceuticals, stem cells, all these things going on. But you know, I know you come from a natural health background. What is your take with all the new technology coming out? And what would be your approach as you think about longevity? Well, I, I think you have to start with the basics and the foundation. And then these other things are great. Everything from infrared saunas to hyperbaric chambers to stem cell injections, peptide therapy, th those are all wonderful. And we can talk about those today. But I think when it comes to health, you need to focus on your spiritual mental health and your eating a really clean diet and movement first and foremost. Let me kind of my thoughts on all of those. That there are plenty of people in uh, around the world who love to be centurions and I think one of the things they all have in common, there's a Harvard study that discovered this, and this really ties into the first thing you asked me. And uh, it has to do with what is the greatest factor for longevity, the single greatest factor. And this Harvard study now that's about 90 years old uh, has found that it's your inner circle, your community. is that If you have a close and inner circle, a very supportive family and friend group, it is the number one factor for living longer. And so the question is, do you have deep, meaningful relationships? How do you pursue those? Well, really, it's following the golden rule, love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you're able to do that, pursue relationships, love your neighbor, and especially build relationships with other virtuous people that also love you back in that same way, you're going to live longer. So that is actually the number one principle above and beyond any of the others is that sort of community piece. The other thing I would say really is related to spiritual health, mental health, and being mindset related. I think that our perception about reality is very important. So you people could be standing in a room and see completely and radically different things. One person has a negative mindset, another positive. There's another study that found people that have a positive mindset live longer. And that's been proven multiple times now. And so I would say that that's the second big thing is, are you pursuing personal growth with your maker? Are you focusing on growing spiritually, personally, mentally in those ways? And so that's the second biggest thing for growth. One thing I do in the morning Dr. V, is I do a spiritual triathlon. I spend the first five, 10 minutes of my morning, I get outside, go on a walk, get a little sunshine, but I spend some time in gratitude and praising God. And God, I'm so thankful for my amazing wife. I'm so thankful for my, my physical health. I'm so thankful for these things. And then I'll go inside and I'll make a superfood smoothie, sit down, read my Bible, and then I will pray and just communicate with God. And so I do that every morning. And that has, I think that is probably my top health practice that I have on a regular basis. And then I tend to spend a little bit of time with my, my wife and my two girls. And then I start work about 9 a.m. or so. But that's another practice. And then what I like about the other, let's just hit on the other two, and that would be nutrition and movement. From a nutritional standpoint, it's eating real food, but it's making sure you're covering your basis. When I think about protein, that's the thing I think a lot of people are deficient in, especially women. Yeah. And so I would focus on getting both animal meat organ meat, so so animal muscle tissue, which is like a chicken breast, a steak, a fish filet. I would do organ meat. I would do bone broth, and I would do some good, some plants there too. And if you do that, you're going to sort of be a well-rounded in a lot of those amino acids that you should be having. Most people just go right for the muscle meat. It's all they eat. The reality is, is if you have something like liver, it's 10 times more nutrient-dense in B vitamins 
than the muscle meat. So I really think that's something we've missed. From a standpoint of essential fatty acids, that I think that if people can really focus on, by the way, another thing about the protein, I think you also want to have a balance of muscle building and collagen building proteins. One third of all of the tissue, the, the protein in our body is made of, of collagen. And so if you're not drinking bone broth or eating the skin of animals or some of the other parts, you know, you're, you're not getting collagen. And this is what we're going to see in the future. Now, look out for this. Just like we needed a balance of omega-3s to omega-6s. We all know that, right? So you need to have a, between a 1 to 1 and a 1 to 4 ratio. That ratio moves outside of that 4 to 1. And, well, now there's inflammation, excess inflammation happening within your body. Well, in that very same way, about 1 to 3 is very close to that ratio. There should be a close to 1 to 3 to 1 to 4 ratio of collagen you're consuming to muscle meat you're consuming. Mm. of animals. And if not, you get a ratio off. So your amino acids get off of methionine and glycine. And it's been shown that even glycine supplementation increases longevity and lifespan. And glycine, again, is the main amino acid along with proline. And then there's hydroxyproline and glutamine. But those are the amino acids you're going to find in bone broth. So so that one is very important that people get collagen, get bone broth so they can keep those, those uh, amino ratios just like you don't want those fatty acid ratios. And then from the omega-3 standpoint, and then from the fat standpoint, you want to be getting omega-3s, wild-caught fish, flax, chia, walnuts, different types of seaweed, that sort of a thing. And then you want to get your unsaturated fats from things like extra virgin olive oil, avocados, it's like almonds. And then you want to be getting your healthy saturated fats. And you can't have too much of a good thing. I mean, you can, if you have a lot of liver stress and gallbladder and lymphatic stress, you don't want to go too high in fat. I mean, keto would be bad for those people, for instance. But, but you do want to get some good fats. And ideally, I think coconut's the best saturated fat for most people. After that, I would say animal fats that were grass-fed, certified, or, you know, organic, just completely natural. And then a little things like butter, if you tolerate that well, would be fine as well. But you do want to get a little bit of saturated fat because your cells are made up of fat. Half of that fat is saturated fat. So we do need some for nerve function, for heart function and for cellular function. And the last thing is getting on carbohydrates. Your carbohydrates, you want those to be nutrient dense. Vegetables are probably the primary source, followed by fruits, followed by, you know, I would say beans and grains. Starches like sweet potatoes are great too. And if you do grains, the only way I like grains are if they're done via sprouted or a sour sourdough fermentation, if you're doing the ancient grain with it. So that's sort of the basis there. And movement wise, I would say walking, I've been surprised. If you look at the studies, walking is one of the top predictors of longevity if you're able to walk and especially walk briskly. So I would say walking is good. The other big thing is muscle is a longevity organ. And so we do want to be making sure we're building muscle uh, every age, even if you're just doing light dumbbells or doing machines, that's fantastic. So make sure you maintain muscle mass through weight training. But I think if people are moving via walking and getting the gym a couple of days a week or at home working out a couple of days a week, if they're eating that baseline sort of diet and working on their spiritual health and have a close community, those are the foundations. Those are the four pillars of, of longevity. That's beautiful. And I, I, I can't wait to ask this question because like you, I'm a girl dad. How old are your daughters? I have a four-year-old and a six-month-old. Oh, wow. I, I've got a three and a bonus daughter who's 10. And I know at least for the three-year-old, getting them to eat certain foods are, are a little bit difficult for me. What would you say to a parent that wants to start instilling this community, these diet rituals and, and whatnot for them? And I hear it from parents all the time. How do you have your, your, your kids eat healthy? Is there a certain way you present it to them that makes it easier for them? And how have you been able to get organ meats into their diet specifically? Well, so I would say that for our daughter, our four-year-old, this is you know, six month old is still only in breastfeeding, but our, for our four-year-old, she just eats what we eat. There's no other choice. You eat what we eat. And so that's just been our, our mentality. And we eat meat, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and healthy fats and hummus, you know, that sort of things. So she eats what we eat. We started off when she was a kid. That's all she ate. And so now, now what's going to happen is there are some parents who maybe didn't start off like that. Yeah. And now you're saying, well, now I want to kind of move in that direction. And, and by the way, we're daughter, she's drinking a lot of bone broth, a lot, but she has not had organ meats yet. We'll eventually have her do some, and by the way, for me, I do organ meats couple times a month. I do the way that I do it is I'll take chicken liver and saute it up in coconut oil with onion and garlic and salt. And, and I like it. I'll do it, do it with some lysided ketchup and, uh, or barbecue sauce. And I, I think it's great, but 
most of the time to get organ meat. It's like my wife and I, every day we do a, a multi-organ supplement. And so it's got things like liver and heart and kidney and adrenals and some of those in there. So we typically do it via tablet or a capsule mm-hmm. most of the time. But again, I, I do some organ meat. I've done cleanses where I've done raw liver for a period of time and, and, and a number of things. But, but with our daughter, at some point, we'll have her do a capsule of, of organ meats daily, probably when she hits... I don't know if we'll wait till six or 12, but we'll have her start doing organ meats at that point. And so, but, but to get these foods, one, if you're excited about it, sometimes your kids will start to get excited about it. Even if it's not initially, they want to be like you. That's the reality. When your kids are younger, especially before they reach teenage years, they really do want to be like you. And so I would say that you just want to model it. That's the biggest thing is you want to model it. And the other thing is you want to flavor it and have great sauces and dips they like. So now our daughter just eats zucchini and broccoli just plain, but you can make homemade vegan cheeses. You can buy cashew cheese. You can get raw sheep cheese. You can get, again, hummus. You can get guacamole. You know, doing dips tends to help. And yeah, I mean, you know, and now listen, she doesn't like everything, but she likes a lot of things. And so I'm trying to think of something like we had recently that she didn't like chili. She didn't want chili. And so we ended up giving her this turkey with mint, with cheese. And she liked that. You do sourdough bread. My wife makes that every day or every other day or so. And so we had that. So I think we have a basis of for a lot of things she likes. There's a thing here or there that she just is not eating. But for the most part, to help people out again, I would just say be creative, model it, try and start them as early as possible and have great dips. Things like that. That's some of the best advice I could I could give. You talked about two things, and I didn't want to just brush over them, but you know, the important things that you brought up was, was community, and certainly they are meant to thrive. I think any, any person here that exists, whether it be whether they have spiritual faith or not, they should recognize that everything that exists belongs to something much bigger, belongs to much higher than a whole. Every single cell in our body has a purpose, but it doesn't exist in itself. The heart cell pumps for the brain, the kidneys, and they all do the same. And we are simply cells in the body of our families, of our teams, of our organizations, humanity itself. But we find that technology tends to, te- can be a barrier to true connection. Because when there is a true connection, we fully connect you and I either on the web, even more so when we are in person hugging it out, oxytocin goes up. And we just know how important oxytocin is in our body for our mental health and in our digestion. For people that you find where they feel isolated, what might be some initial steps to really start to build that community? Because I have gotten Dr. Vu, look, you're in tons of masterminds. We see you with all these different people. It seems very difficult for me to to connect with people. I feel lonely or I feel like I need to be someone else. How would you maybe advise that person to start building these positive nurturing tribe and communities. So, and by the way, you know, you're, uh, so, so here, here, here's my advice. One, know that you were created for community. That's the first thing to know and realize that you're going to be healthier. You were literally created for community. And God created us because he wanted a family. And interesting, when you look at the first letter of the Judeo-Christian Bible in the book of Genesis, the first letter means home or family. And that's part of why God created us. And so all that being said, you got to know that. The next thing I would say is you want to, positive community. You want a community that's doing something bigger. They're about doing something that's meaningful and significant. And nothing is more significant than, and, and nothing is more far out than eternity. And so thinking about eternity, you know, there's, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis, and I love it. He says this essentially. He says, people that do the most in this life for the people who think most about the next life. And so being aware of that, and this is why I think plugging into a religious community is the best way to go. And that's for me. So I'm just sharing what I did I was in college and I I had great friends in high school, a great community there and went off to college and I was very involved at at, at church and my community and serving and things like that. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio and I ended up going to college and then I joined a fraternity. And then after being in that for a year or two, I realized I'm just not fulfilled. I feel kind of empty. I've got all these people around me, but none of them are my, none of them feel like real friends. And I remember going and praying and I said, God, would you send a flood of just good Christian people and specifically men into my life? Because I feel lost right now. I don't have community at all. I feel really empty inside. And then I went and showed up on that one. The next Wednesday, I went and showed up to this group that was meeting on campus. I saw a flyer that was like a, a group that was you know, a, a group that praise and worship. And, and there was a certain like a lecture. 
on on spirituality and God each week. And so I went to that. And at the end, I had a guy come up to me and we started chatting. He said, hey, I'm starting a growth group. Would you want to be in it? And I said, be great. And uh, to me, that was a direct response from God. I mean, I prayed about it and, and God sort of sent someone. But also I showed up. I took action. I went to the actual event to try and meet and pursue and find people to spend time with. And it wasn't easy. It was uncomfortable sometimes at first and trying to be the outsider kind of moving my way in. But over time, man, I'm so blessed that I did. So I don't encourage people, find a place of worship, find a church, find a synagogue, find, you know, find a place where you can go and really connect with others or pursue relationships with those positive people. And if, if you get to one and you feel like, oh, this isn't the right fit for me, then go to another one. Keep pursuing those relationships. And I would say plugging into a growth group, something like that, that maybe a lot of churches and places of worship have. I think that's a great place to go and get started. That's what I did. So, so it's hard for me to give advice out of it. Mean, that's what I personally did. And it radically changed and improved my life. So I think that's, that's for most people what I would suggest. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. If you are, I just wanted to let you know, join our community. There's so many free resources and a great community of people that desire health, happiness, human potential to have more in their life, more health, more energy. And when you have those two things together, you could create more happiness, more abundance, whether it be financial, uh, romantic, all these things in your life. Um, and if you're just starting out, you don't know where to go, just sign up for thrivestatestarter.com because in there, you're going to get a bundle of information that includes a longevity ebook, a longevity and performance resource guide, lecture notes that come from my keynotes at Google, at Fortune 500 companies, uh, all the insights in that keynote in lecture slide form given to you. And then finally, breathwork. I share three powerful breathwork exercises to access calm, which really gives you clarity and peace during the day to access energy. If you need to wake up and, and really motivate yourself. And finally, a breathwork routine that you could do every single morning so that you could be very intentional with, with how you create that day. You could find all this stuff delivered free to your inbox at thrivestatestarter.com. And our community is growing. If you want to be a part of a community of people that desire the Thrive State, that are really in Thrive State themselves and, and help other people along with that, you could be a part of the community. You can get group coaching from me. We do breathwork sessions, meditation sessions, and you also get to drop in and participate in podcasts in the future. You could find more about the community at mythrivestate.com. That's M Y. E-H-R-I-V-E-S-T-A-T-E dot com. So check out those resources. You're not going to be disappointed. And please enjoy the remainder of this podcast. I think that's very valuable. One, actually going to a physical community is, is so important. And I think the other thing you mentioned is if it doesn't resonate with you, you don't feel fulfilled, if you don't feel connected, give it some time because it, anytime you, you enter a community, it, it takes some, uh, some adjustment, but it could certainly pick another one. And, and let me, let me point this out too, that, that there is a study that came out that found that people who attend religious services regularly, they live 33% longer than other people. So even from a safe word, from a scientific standpoint, you going to a church or a growth group or serving in your community, you will live one third long. I mean, that's a lot longer, a lot. It brings up really that that aspect of purpose and spirituality, which is what I wanted to, to talk about next. You know, if you look at the Blue Zones, there were several ways they lived life, moved naturally every single day. They didn't eat, didn't even process foods. They had rituals that deal with stress. They had the deep sense of connection with a tribe and a community, and they all had a sense of purpose. And purpose, we know, has people live seven to 10 years longer. We know that it actually preserves your, your telomeres. I've got my take on what purpose is. I think from a spiritual aspect, I'm not Christian per se, but I am very, very spiritual. I do believe in a God. And I think certainly God has placed us here for a purpose. And it's not something we have to go find because I think we are given these gifts. And if we just show up as ourself, knowing that we're here to share our gift with other people, that's your purpose. Your purpose is you. And I wonder if for you, have you gotten the question as to what is purpose and how people tap into that? Yeah, I have. You know, one of the interesting statistics, and it's surprising, I think, according to 
a recent study, only 25 per, 25% of people are certain about what their purpose is. Another 40% are fuzzy, and then the rest just don't have any, have no idea what their purpose is. So only 25%. And this is a big deal. Even there, there's another study that found that when somebody retires from work, if they don't then find something else to a way to contribute, mm -hmm. that great increase in mortality. Yeah. So really having a purpose, as you pointed out, is incredibly important to our longevity. When it comes to purpose, there is a great practice in Japan called Ikigai. And so I think that's one thing that people can use as a, as a framework. But let me instead paint something to where maybe, maybe even make it more simple. I don't think people talk about this enough, but what does the ideal world look like? Right now, we're living in a world where there's people are spending five plus hours a day on social media and TV. There's obviously a lot of crime. There uh, is you know, a, a massive amount of poverty in the world. There's human trafficking. There's a lot of there, there's a lot of problems. I mean, obviously, there's environmental issues, pollution. So when I step back and I think about what is what does paradise look like for us all? Or what does the ideal life look like? I think it looks like like a paradise, like a garden of being. I and mean, imagine if when people are having the best times of their life, a lot of times they're on vacation, like go somewhere, you go to the beach, you go to the mountains, you go to the whitewater rafting, you go somewhere where the environment is beautiful. And I think that when, when I think about what is the perfect world look like, I think one, thinking about the earth, the earth looks perfect. And so it's full of rain for us and there's no pollution. Everything is green and beautiful and lush. If anyone has ever read or watched the Lord of the Rings and you see some of these mythological places like Rivendell or Lothlorien, you're seeing a piece of heaven. It's interesting when you read the Bible in Genesis, part of God's initial command and his commission for Adam was to take the Garden of Eden and make the entire earth, a garden of Eden, turn the entire place into this regenerative food force of this regenerative paradise. And then when you read the last book of the Bible in Revelation, it says that in the end, we will live in a garden city. So we took a garden and we spread it throughout all of the world. And then imagine like, you know, Chelsea and I went on our honeymoon in St. Lucia and we stayed in this place that was like carved in the side of a mountain, waterfall, open air, just absolutely absolute paradise. And it's like that. So think about what, is, what if you had your perfect home and your perfect environment and you walk out your front door and there's a pristine lake there and there's you just picture in there's every fruit tree you can imagine. Every everything is perfect. So so that's one thing. So so we should all part of our purpose should be all of us should be, be, be should be towards moving towards that. Now, what's the other purpose? Let's talk about our other purposes to be tied to God. We, being connected to our, our creator, having a deep, intimate, meaningful relationship. Have, have you ever, most of us admire other people. For instance, it would make some uh, some people's day probably to meet you, Dr. V, if they're, if they're ever big fans of you. Or for other people, if maybe they're a big fan of Tim Tebow, or maybe it's the Pope, or maybe it's some other celebrity, Taylor Swift, I don't know. And when you meet that person, It'd really be full of joy. I mean, great, right? They, maybe they connect with you. They say something complimentary. There's something. So God is infinitely more praiseworthy and incredible in terms of a personality and everything else than any other human being. So the fact that we'll be able to, in the future, connect with in a much more what we feel like is a tangible way in the future. I mean, amazing. Imagine your best moment with another person. Now am amplify at times billion. And so you're going to be in the presence of God and want to connect with God. And the other one is, you know, there's, you're going to be with other people. So again, imagine the, like I and Chelsea and I were dating and, you know, you sort of like uh, initial sort of, you know, puppy love, just, just, you know, you know, there's almost chemistry connection like never before. And, and again, you can still have that in moments when, when you're married too. But my point is, is that, you know, the operating and able to operate in perfect character and two people are operating in perfect character in a perfect world, they're is going to be perfect connection. And so when we think about our purpose, I think we have to have those things in mind is what should our end look like? It's called telos in Greek or Aristotle called it that and our per it's purpose. And so he, and, and they called it telos because it was telescope. That's your, define your purposes. Look at the end, look at it out as far as you can see and, and where, where's your finish line? Okay, well now your purpose. And so how can you, like 
everybody has a unique gift and skill. Everybody is different. And so what is your unique gift and skill and how can you contribute to making the world a heavenly place? We're all called to love God, connect with him more deeply, love people, and then make earth a heavenly place. And if we're able to do those three things and use our gift and skills to do that, there in life, your purpose. Now, the other exercise is a key GI, which is this. It's what are you good at? Okay, what are the gifts God's given you? What are you good at? Number two is what are you passionate about? What do you love doing? What brings you joy? Like I look at it. Like I feel God's gifted me at it. And I love teaching people how to get healthy, both in body, mind, you know, in body, mind, and spirit. So I have what I'm good at. I have what I love. The other thing is, where's there an opportunity? Well, hey, there's an opportunity right now. Part of my purpose is going to be educating via video or in-person lectures or however it is on a podcast or my health newsletter, whatever, you know. And then what gives you the greatest reward? Now, that can be tied to passion. Sometimes that's financial compensation as well. But I think the biggest thing is, is what are you passionate about and what are you good at? And does it lead towards the good of society? Are you sending the world backwards? Because there's people doing great things in the world. There's Klaus Schwab. There's Bill Gates. They're destroying the world. Okay. Versus, hey, you actually helping heal the world and move it toward, move towards heaven. That's so good. I have data that I recently went through and it just goes to show we know there's a part of our brain and nervous system. And so many people, we, we had so many conversations in the mental health summit on this is the default mode network, this part of our brain and nervous system, a very primitive part that's the autopilot survival mode of the brain. It's one that takes in the beliefs, values, perspectives of the people around you in life when you're growing up, but it also remembers the time we were tra traumatized, either not being seen, not being heard, or people have big traumas, divorce, drugs, neglect, things of that nature. And it forms this, this, this in, in, in our uh, mind. And if we go through life in that ego space, me being somebody that didn't feel like he was good enough, that didn't feel like he was worthy and w went to all the best medical schools, battle like Victoria and had to shoot for the hospitals, you know, all the choices I was making because I wanted to feel better from that ego space. I was overweight. I was diabetic. I was hypertensive. I was on prescription medications. So that drove this, the messages to cells that we, we were in danger. Turns out once we start to serve, once we start to put the focus, not on us, but on other people, we've seen on fMRI machines as well as other studies that that portion of brain, that default mode network quiets down. That quieting down actually causes a reduction in stress, a reduction in cortisol, a reduction in inflammatory markers, and an increase in immunity markers. So once you start to feel these three things, safety, love, and acceptance, it's very powerful medicine for the brain, which is why purpose biochemically and molecularly leads to many more meaning in our life. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it follows very closely to Maslow's hierarchy, right? I mean, you know, when, when you add it, I mean, either they really all have needs. Yeah. And they start at very material. They start with food, shelter, water, and what you're saying is that safety and security. And then if we move up or wrong, it really is tapping more into that you belong, you're accepted. And then from there, you're loved. You actually have this community, this deep relationship. And then from there, there are other needs beyond that. And the other one is, is that you're using your gifts and skills towards a purpose. And the highest one, that self-actualization or beyond, is really tapping into the divine, the spiritual, some of what we just talked about. So, so yeah, I mean, I, absolutely essential for our mental well-being. And, you know, one of the things that I know you talked about some, I know there's, just, you know, doctors who get into this, but our mental and spiritual health affect our physical health in a really, really dramatic way. They're all you know, energetically connected, every single thing. I mean, if one's off, it affects every other aspect of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this was something, and this is why I have spent a good part of my career studying traditional Chinese medicine and ancient forms of medicine, because they, they, they were aware of this. I mean, if you have five elements of Chinese medicine, I think it's the most accurate form of diagnosing and then knowing how to treat today. They knew different emotions affected different organ systems. And these are absolute facts I'm about to share with everybody. The emotion of fear affects the adrenal glands. Now, we all know that, right? It puts your body in a fight or flight response. Your body starts producing, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine, or it's producing cortisol. So, so we know if you have too much fear over time, you'll start to wear down those adrenal glands and then cortisol will start to be, will, will be. By the way, if you throw cortisol off, <laughs> you throw insulin off, you throw melatonin off, then that throws your thyroid hormones off, that throws off you. 
So it worked like a domino. One goes down. Well, then it affects everything as you were just referencing, Dr. V. So, and then the other thing, so so we know fear affects the adrenals and kidneys. This is also why kids can wet the bed. And a certain form of fear causes you to be frightened, they'll, they'll, they'll wet the bed. And the, the next one is worry. Have you ever worried so much you got an upset stomach? There's a girl I used to study with in, 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 in college, and she would get upset because she would worry so much about her exam. So we know that worrying affects the upper digestive system. The emotion of feeling anger, frustrated, if you get really impatient about things, it affects the liver. Uh, that'll cause constipation, frustration. You'll notice, and even if people are constipated or little kids, they'll feel frustrated that they can't go. So those things are connected. So that anger, uh, frustration, and patience will affect that resentment as well. Uh, and then we have the emotion of, this is a big one, grief. You've had something happen in your past and you haven't been able to let go of it. You still live with it today. That shuts down your immune system. It affects your lungs and your colon. And then by their foods for all these things, the last one is anxiety. If you feel an anxiousness and nervousness about something, your blood will go up. It affects your heart and cardiovascular system. So we know, so, so if you want to know what actually will, there is a study out of Stanford and you saw this, I'm sure, but basically they all that, they went and tested and they found that for most people, we all have organs in our body that age faster than other organs. So while you might be sitting here, I've said, or somebody might be sitting here and they've got the muscles of a you know, let's say they're 40 years old and they have the muscles of a 30 years old. You know, they're pretty strong, but maybe they have a heart of a 65 year old, right? So, so all that being said, it's important that we know those things because you want to be young everywhere, right? So, but those will cause those organs to age even more quickly than being a bad diet. I mean, think about this. I mean, they saw presidents or somebody that's in a stressful situation. I actually, I just had somebody recently have this happen. They lost a loved one and went through just a really traumatic two years and their hair turned gray and they started getting age spots on their skin. I mean, it had boom. I mean, literally gray. Well, how could that possibly happen? That much stress, that much whatever. And, and if I listen now, maybe if you wouldn't even eat, maybe if he was eating McDonald's or fast food, every meal, okay, then he could probably age that quickly too. But for the most part, I mean, you will age you very, very quickly. So to your point, you know, I, this mind body connection, you know, one other thing I, I, I've mentioned before, this placebo, the pulley is amazing. I mean, the fact that, you know, you could sugar pill and, and, and reverse a condition. I mean, it, it frequently. So I, uh, yeah. And, and let me share this. This will be real quick, but you know, back in line, main drug that gave fallen morphine. Of course, morphine is an incredibly powerful drug. The way that we came up with the placebo effect today was, was via the physician read of morphine in one of the one of the, one of these battles and these men were in excruciating pain lost limbs i mean just excruciating felt like he had to give them something so he gave them sugar pills and the craziest part of all of it is about 30 to 40 percent of them said they felt the same amount of pain relief as if they were given morphine mm -hmm. they thought they were getting morphine think about that your body can create pain relieving chemicals as the equivalent of morphine in a very similar way if you want to heal and reverse disease you got to believe and know it I mean, it's really in longevity. So that's, so anyways, this money connection and we see a, you know, it's significant talked about enough. That is so beautiful. And I wonder what the answer to the last question I'm going to ask in a second is, but before I get there, if people want to find out more about this, second of all, I would love to gig out more about this stuff. I know we only talked about it at the end, but you know, emotional, spiritual health. And, and now I believe that we have the, you know, starting to get biological and scientific data on why it works. But in any case, if people want to find out more about you, your newsletter, and everything you're a part of, where do, where, where do people go? Yeah, people can uh, check out my podcast. It's called the Dr. Josh Jack Show. It's on uh, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Also, if people want to learn more, like I, I, I've done podcasts on methylation, on longevity, on reversing hypothyroidism, um, you know, healing leaky gut, uh, reversing autoimmune disease. I've covered a lot of these topics. They could go to YouTube and search Dr. Josh Jack's hypothyroid or autoimmune disease are what you're searching for. I've done a lot of in-depth, you know, shows on that. So, so the Dr. Jack show, the other thing would be just social media. People can check me out at Dr. Josh X. If people want to learn more about this spiritual health and mindset medicine, I wrote a book called think this, not that it's a New York times bestseller. You can go to Amazon and search just Josh X. Think this, the book will come up. And I think that you know, they've gotten really good on that. So I think people would really enjoy that. The next time we'll talk about nutrition. You know, I love talking about diabetes too. We obviously talked a little bit, you know, I will say, let's just mention this quickly. I think that, you know, when we think of the day, a lot of times people are thinking about things like 
NMN or NR, like like a lot of you know, vitamin B, that you know we think about resveratrol. We, we think about a lot of sort of isolated compounds and supplements. I, I don't I don't think they're as effective as getting the real food. You know, when you look at medicine, there were foods that would increase what's called qi and and jing, and some of those foods. Just to give a list for people, if you really want to l- extend your lifespan, here are some of those foods. One is green tea. You know, matcha green tea can amazing polyphenols and compounds that have been shown to increase longevity. Another really unique one is royal jelly, which is found in raw honey. Royal jelly actually sustains the queen bee to live 40 times longer than other bees. And I think there's a lot of really unique foods in there. Chinese medicine, also a lot of ginseng for men over 50. Dong kwai for women for longevity. Ashwagandha is used in Ayurvedic medicine for longevity. And then there are herbs like it has a lot of longevity research. And then reishi mushroom. It is known as the mushroom of immortality. Now, there's a lot more I could go into. Those are just a few, but this is something else I love talking about is these sort of longevity foods. And I think even more than taking that, you know, resveratrol, you know, eat blueberries, right? Get resveratrol via the food you're eating. Uh, and even the supplements I take, those are all from food. Like I take a bone protein. It's just dehydrated bone broth. I'm getting a food that's concentrated. My This morning, I did a organ supplement that was in a tablet form. I did turmeric. That's an herb. I did ashwagandha. I did probiotics, which were extracted from you know raw from uh, dairy and coconut. And so all that being said, make sure when you're buying supplements, they're quality, that they are food-based, because there are studies now showing that if you're doing enriched nutrients or synthetic nutrients, one of those, for instance, if you're doing synthetic folate via fortified cereals and breads, it actually increases risks potentially of cancer and learning disorders in children. If you're taking a slated calcium supplement, it can increase the risk of calcification in your arteries and heart disease. So it's important to just do, do the realest things possible, follow the foundations we've talked about. But Dr. V, I appreciate you having me on. It was such an honor. I uh, And I love what you're doing. So again, thanks thanks so much. Your last question for you is, yeah. has been... Your best medicine. Oh, wow. My best medicine has been, I'm going to give you two things, but my number one is going to be reading my Bible in the morning. I was going I to just it, faith with something that's going to be important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's triathlon. I'm really there walking and just saying everything I'm grateful for, reading my Bible, spending a few moments in prayer, just being grateful for my day. I mean, that's, that is the best. Another form of medicine are hugs. I mean, to me, when I saw something, I, you know, I talked to early, being in the state of fear, or grief or anxiety, what that does to age us. Yeah. Well, if you can get yourself in a state of joy and hope and love, that is healing. Yeah. And science shows that. The Bible shows that. So for me, hugging my daughters and my wife in the morning, those big long hugs, those are healing. So hug somebody. I think, you know, we went through this time with COVID where people really lost, con- people started, con- actually, physical contact has really lessened. And I think we need to bring it back in a healthy way, especially hugging family members. Of course, you mentioned oxytocin being released. That's critical. So I would say, you know, the Bible and best medicine. Dr. Josh Axe, appreciate your time, your wisdom, and being with us today on the Thrive State Podcast. I hope you enjoy that episode of the Thrive State Podcast. And if you're finding that this content is really helping you and your family members, please consider supporting our mission and our cause of elevating health, happiness, and human potential for people all over the world. You can do so by making sure that you subscribe to this podcast, sharing it with your friends and family members, and leaving us a five-star review wherever podcasts are heard. All these things are gonna really help elevate the show and to give us the resources to continue to bring more content just like this to yourself as well as the people that you love. If you haven't already, you might wanna consider joining our community. We actually have a community where people get to engage with me in group sessions, where we do breath work, meditation, where we do challenges together, really to be able to get us access to health, happiness, human potential, so that we could have longevity and performance in our life as well. You could check out our community at mythrivestate.com. That's M-Y-T-H-R-I-B-E-S-T-A-T-E dot com. And if you haven't already, pick up a copy of my book, Thrive State. It really gives you all the tools, the pillars that you need to create a blueprint to control the energetics of your life. Who are you? How do you show up in the world? The choices that you consistently make create an energy in your body, and you can control this. And when you can control that, 
you also control the messages you give to your DNA that gives you access again to optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. And let me also just share a free gift to you. If you haven't already, please pick up my longevity and performance bundle where I share lecture notes, eBooks, breathwork exercises, and longevity and performance resources at thrivestatestarter.com. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. Thank you for helping us grow. Remember always, my friends, that you are your best medicine.